Well, thank you very much. As advertised, this is a bit of a different kind of lecture, um, and it's a bit like performance art, at least it feels that way to me. Um, and it's not really in the spirit of the other lectures I've been giving. Um, but uh, in a few moments, I'm going to start a brand new, fresh Mathematica notebook with no kernel running or anything like that. And in about 40 minutes or so, we will have an implementation of all three amplitudes and n equals 4, which means also for gluons. And it'll be about 100 to 1,000 times faster than what's publicly available. And there's another factor of about 100 to 1,000 that's low-lying that'll leave as homework. Um, so I, I hope we can do all that. But um, I realize that Uten almost got to it, but uh, didn't quite get to the um, recursion relations in momentum twister space. It's a bit simpler in momentum twister space than in momentum space, in part because momentum conservation is automatic. You don't need to shift a pair of legs. You only need to shift one. And this is what it looks like. And you do not need to understand this formula. Um, part of the philosophy of this, t of this uh, tutorial is imagine you're seeing this for the first time and you're trying to, you're just trusting the author of this note that whatever this thing makes sense and you want to verify that it makes sense. You want to build it and verify it internally without reference to some other program or something like that. Um, and that's really our goal. But because I think I can do this efficiently enough, um, I'm going to waste a few moments and give you, for those of you who think visually, I think very visually, I have a bit of a visualization for the momentum twister geometry in BCFW, what these terms are, where they're coming from. If you don't think visually, just ignore the, the following couple minutes here. So in momentum twister space, we're talking about points in P3, which I, at least I think I can visualize. Um, and a generic configuration of momentum twisters, this is some generic configuration of points in P3. Okay, and they're ordered in some way, so there's some kind of, you know, ring of momentum twisters, points in P3, and they have labels, there's one, etc. And unlike the normal, the momentum space BCFW recursion, which, where you need to shift two legs to preserve, conserve momenta, in momentum twister space you don't, who cares? So you're just going to shift one of the, the, the momentum twisters along the line of its neighbor. And the canonical one, the one that's in the formula, in the memo is where you shift leg, uh, momentum twister n along the direction of n, uh, n minus 1. So it's along this direction, and we're going to add a little parameter and slide it along that line. Okay? And where are we going to stop? Where are the factorizations? It's, so the only thing you need for momentum conservation in on-shell conditions is that you have a ring of momentum twisters. So you just need to have a ring. So when does this, what, what special happens? It's when n hat hits a plane when it crosses a line. So specifically, let's say there, that's the line a, a, a minus 1. So this is the plane 1, a, a minus 1. And when n hat hits that plane, something magical happens. Namely, the line between 1 and n hat now crosses the line a, a minus 1. And this allows you to define a new point, a hat, and you get a ring of momentum twisters 1 up to a minus 1, a hat, and another set of momentum twisters, a hat, up to n hat. These are the terms that appear in the, in the bridge. OK, so this is what the geometry is doing. Um, the formula for what these hats mean, it's a simple exercise, but I don't have time to do it. So just take it on faith for the moment. And let me, as promised, I'm going to actually quit the kernel completely. I'm going to quit Mathematica. And I'm going to start with a semi-blank notebook. The only thing that's loaded is the uh, formatting. All right, and because I realize that most people can't see the bottom of the screen, I'm just going to leave this kind of PDF file in the background, especially for those of you who cannot read the, the thing on the left-hand side, where it's also written. But this is the formula we would like to implement. All right, without further ado, let's get started. So part one, we'd like to do tree-level BCFW um, in Twisters. So the basic goal here is um, define a function which we're going to call R amp, which is a function of n and k, which returns a list. It's important for me that it's going to be a list of products of R invariants. Um, see, it comes out of this, this bit here. There are all these little R invariants here with lots of shifted arguments, um, whose sum represents the um, endpoint n to the k MHV amplitude. 
Okay, and we'd also like to verify that and other things, but in this section at least we just would like to um, um, build this function here. So this, the first step we're going to do is, is a huge cost of efficiency, but it's just simple. So it's um, conceptually very clear, which is that we're going to do recursion um, um, as a replacement. So we're basically going to strategy. We're going to define a replacement rule um, which acts on a forever um, undefined um, symbol, which I'm going to call amp k leg list. So it's important to note that, by the way, the, the, if you look at the recursion, that the recursion, the, the arguments of the amplitude on the left and on the right involve weird shifted twisters, and they don't start at one, and they don't end at n, maybe. They, they have to be a general list of arguments. So it's important that it's not just one through n, that it's a list of the arguments there, the leg list. Okay. And repeatedly um, replaces um, this with the right-hand side of the BCFW formula. Okay, simple enough. So we're going to define our function BCFW recurse. We're not going to be done with it in this line, but we're going to start. And it's going to take amp k with some leg lists. This underscore, for those of you who are Mathematica, or are unfamiliar with Mathematica, this means a symbol, so it'll, it's a, it becomes a function of this thing. And just like you would do colon equals, I'm going to do a colon arrow, which is, um, it's a uh, replace delayed. So it, it acts like a function on the left-hand side. So, and I'm going to use this which business, which is a little silly, but because it's just three cases to consider. The first case is kind of trivial. MHV amplitudes in momentum twister space are one. What I really mean is that the ratio of this divided by the MHV amplitude is one, which is a complete triviality. So if k equals zero, then return one. The next thing is that worse than MHV bar amplitudes are zero. So if k is greater than n minus 4, we don't have an n yet, so let's just call it, it's the length of the leg list, minus 4, then return 0. Um, and then unfortunately, Mathematica doesn't, it, which requires an even number of arguments, it's always a test followed by the output. So we need to say if true, so for else. So if k equals 0, then do this. If k is greater than this, do this. If true, which is always true do this. And we're just going to replace it with the right-hand side of the recursion relation. For those of you who can see this, I'm just going to copy this thing in. Amp, the same k, and it eats the legs 1 through n minus 1. So for those of you who don't, aren't familiar with the Mathematica syntax here, if I had like a range 7, a list of length 7, I could go 1 to minus 1, which is all of it, or I could take the minus second entry, which delete, from 1 to the minus second entry, which is the penultimate entry. So we're going to do leg list one up to minus two, okay? But then plus this summoned, and this summoned is going to occupy us for the next few minutes. So this summoned, let's say it's a BCFW bridge, we're going to leave this undefined for a little while. Um, uh, uh, bridge indices, say, I don't know what this thing is yet, but it definitely depends on the leg list, okay? And the bridge indices are basically all the kinds of pairs of things, all the, the, the data you need to specify, the A, you know, N left, N right, K left, K right, et cetera. And so we'll just call a, this function that where these, the terms that occur in the summoned, we'll call BCFW partitions, because it's a partitioning. It's a little bit like a coproduct, by the way. And let's say it's going to eat N and K, so length, leg list, and K. Okay. Now, if I did this correctly, I think we should be okay. We just need to define this bridge function, which is a little hard. That's not hard, but it's the harder one. And BCFW partitions, which is fairly trivial. So let's start with the partitions. Cross the bridge. So the idea here, goal, is for any given n and k, we just, we just want to um, want a list of uh, term indices um, that appear in the summoned. Um, and we're going to do, you can format it however you'd like, but format it according to um, in 
my preferences, which my preference is that I want a list of things data and left, k left, and, and right, k right. So I would like a list of pairs of lists, okay, it's a bit involved, um, for each term that can appear in the summand. Recall that um, n is n left plus n right minus 2, and k is k left plus k right plus 1. Okay? So, in, this is going to be, we're going to, there are two kinds of styles of function building that I'm going to use, and this one is like when you build a function that should have an argument, but you just really want to see it work on an explicit case. So, in that case, I, I morally, I find it morally abhorrent to define something like little n equals anywhere in a notebook. This is dangerous and silly. So I'm going to use with n equals 8, k, k equals 2. This is the 8 point n squared mhv amplitude. Okay. And we'd like to have a table with these kinds of terms in it. So a table, n left, k left, n right, k right. Um, Simple enough. Now we need to give it some ranges. And n right run, runs from 4 to n minus 1. And k right runs from 0 to n right minus 4. OK. Now the, we haven't defined our n left and k left, but it follows directly from this, you know, from the ranges that we use to define it. So in particular, n left is just n minus n right plus 2. And k left is k minus k right uh, minus 1. Okay, now there's actually a problem with this that I might have not noticed if I, if I weren't familiar with how to, well, if I were a little less familiar with Mathematica, which is that this is not really what I wanted. I wanted a list of lists of lists, not a list of lists of lists of lists. Um, so if you look at the last entry of the, of the above expression, you'll see that it is a list of, it is a grouped thing. And it's because it's a double summoned, it's a double table. So we could use flatten to do this, but I'm just going to use join because it's easier for me. So now it's a list of lists of lists. It's exactly what I wanted, not an extra list. Okay. So now we have this thing. But look at this. The first, this last term here is the three point n to the minus two mhv amplitude. That's pretty horrible. So let's go ahead and clean this up a little bit from all the um, vanishing terms. So how would I? I I'm, so I would like to. Apply a list that, that I would apply a function that's going to delete all the terms which obviously vanish, and to do that, I'm going to test it on each one of these <coughs> entries, and so I'm going to have something like non-vanishing Q, which is the syntax that Mathematica kind of likes, um, and I would, could apply it to the term in that notation with this at at. If this is unfamiliar to you, don't worry about it. This notebook is going to be shared, and you can play with it later. Um, but this is a uh, the kind of Mathematica syntax that I can't even bear to get away from. I mean, I could write apply, but that's not going to help anybody either. So non-vanishing, but now this would ask, this answers the question whether non-vanishing the pair, but I really, it's just easier for us to look at individual amplitudes separately. So at, at, at is like at, at, except for that it, it takes two, it does that, okay? So, Okay, so this is what at does. It just has a function. It takes a square bracket on the, the pair, uh, you know, the item. If I do at at, it deletes the outer curly brackets. And if I do at at at, um, it, it's just going to replace, it's going to go inside the list and it's going to eat functions like this. So, um, of course, what we really want, it's non-vanishing if both of them are non-vanishing. So, non-vanishing Q, both of them. This is the function that we'd like to apply on everything. Of course, we haven't defined it yet. And this, this weird little syntax here, this ampersand uh, and hashtag and at sign, is just a complicated way of saying it's a function of where this is the argument and this is, this is the symbol that it gets replaced by whatever it eats. OK. Anyway, if you're not familiar with this notation, you should learn it. You look up function, literally the capital F function in the documentation center. OK. So this is the kind of thing that we would like to, to apply. So that's non-vanishing Q, N, and K. Now, I would, if I had a little more time and this were a little bit more cozy, I might um, get you to figure out what's wrong with the following, with what I just wrote. Can anybody tell me off the top of their head? It's kind of a silly thing. This is something that's very easy to miss on the first time you program it. But there is an exceptional case that this is not missing. So obviously, k has to be between 0 and n minus 4, uh, unless n equals 3, in which case it can be 
the three particle MHV would be excluded by this. So I'm going to say or n and k is equal to 3, 2. Oh, 3, 0. So the three particle MHV does not pass the first test, but it should better pass the, it had better pass the test. So now we look at this and see, ah, nope, not non-vanishing. So in order to select a list from a list, the sublist of list that passes some test, you use the function called select. So select, and then you apply a function to every argument on that list, and this is our function. Okay, so now it's going to apply this, and I can do this, oops, not on last, but on this, and you see it applies, it passes, every term passes, so we're done. Good, finish calling. Now, at this point, I'm going to take a brief aside. You can tell that I have time to spare in this, so let's just, it's just kind of a fun aside application, but let's do, um, just given what we have already, we can do something kind of cute. We can count the number of terms in BCFW. I mean, count the hard way. There's a closed formula for it. I'm just going to imagine we didn't know what it was. So again, with, say, n equals 8, k equals 2, the 8 particle and squared MHV, it should, it's, every, it should, it's definitely my favorite amplitude. Um, we look at BCF, oh, I didn't actually put things together yet. Sorry, let me pause. I didn't define the function I wanted to define. This is the function I want to define but I need to actually define it. So it's BCFW partition. This is our goal, right? N and K is now this here. So this was, this was part of our first line of code. Now we have it defined. Good. And now I need to call it, which is why it's important that it existed. N and K. So here, this is just giving us the same list of terms that we just saw a moment ago. And the, the idea here is to define something like, um, like what we had just had a moment ago, but something instead where it's terms in BCFW. So like before where we checked, is it non-vanishing Q, non-vanishing yes or no? Now it's going to be the, the number of terms in this part of the BCFW expansion is the number of terms in the 7 point n to the 1 MHV amplitude times the number of terms in the 3 point MHV amplitude. So it's of course the product of those two times. And that means that we want to take this and we want to, um, we're going to map it over the whole list and we're going to add them all up with something called total. It's a simple function. Total. So this is what the first level of recursion looks like. The number of terms in the 8 particle n squared mhv is the number of terms in 5 particle times 5 particle, etc. Okay? Now we're actually missing a term, which is the leading term of the recursion relation, which is terms in BCFW um, n minus 1 and k. Because there's always that one lower point amplitude as a seed for, this rec for the recursion. Okay. So let's just check that we didn't make a mistake. BCF, let's say terms in BCFW, 8 particle, oh, sorry, I haven't defined it yet. Again, oh, it's good, it's this undefined symbol. Let's define it. Terms in BCFW, N and K. And again, we need to have, this is going to recurse to, to infinity unless we give it some sort of bo bottom. And so we're going to say that if K is, is 0, if it's MHV, then there's one term in BCFW. If K is greater than N minus 4, there are no terms in BCFW. And if true, then it's this formula. So we're going to copy in this formula. Okay, let's try it out. Terms in BCFW, A particle, N squared, MHV, 20 terms. That is the right answer. I happen to know that. Some of you might be thinking that this is a pretty silly bit of code. You see, every single time it encounters every sub-amplitude, it, it actually recomputes it from scratch all the way down to the bottoms of depths and then starts again. It makes no use of the fact that it's encountered the same function many times. And you can see how bad this is by terms in BCFW, so the 14 particle and to the fifth MHV amplitude, which is the parity even one. And we can use timing to see how bad it is. The first entry is how many seconds it took, which is one half a second. It might not seem like much to you, but it's bad. And 19,404 is the correct answer, so good. But let's go ahead and speed things up um, by saving intermediate results to memory. So the idea here, we're going to now clear, we're going to clear what we just did, clear all terms in BCFW. And we're going to use the same exact definition, but for those of you, this is kind of like an intermediate Mathematica trick. So this colon equals means when you see the left-hand side, do the right-hand side. But do not think that you know the left-hand side until you've encountered it. 
So every single time you see it, it, it does the right-hand side fresh. This is in contrast to the equal sign, which defines it into to permanent memory. But you can do both. It's called set delayed set. And the idea is that now, when you encounter it for the first time, I can define it for all of time and say that is equal to this. So the first time it's called, it sets it forever. Okay, so let's define that. And we can see the comparison with this 14 particle and to the fifth MHV amplitude. It's, it's 0.005 seconds, so it's about a factor of 100 improvement. Okay, and just to prove to you that this is permanently set to memory as it really should be, we can copy it one more time and you'll see that now it's a microsecond. It's 10 microseconds. Okay, so that's just a lookup table at that point. So good. So this, by the way, is the kind of improvement that you should be doing if you want to do the homework later because this replacement rule business makes absolutely no use of storing intermediate steps. This is, this is an easy factor of 100 to 1,000 in improvement in speed. All right. I think we're all set. So let's do part, um, the BCFW bridge. Um, Okay, so as, bef as we saw, we saw, we had something called, um, we had a function called um, BCFW bridge, which ate some term indices, which was the output of, um, of, uh, of BCFW partitions, and then it ate some leg list. And now we'd like this, we'd like this to return um, the product of lower point amplitudes um, and the R invariant, because that's the only thing that's going to survive at the end of the day, um, that appear in the summand. So here I'm going to program a little differently. I'm going to actually, um, so this is our function BCFW bridge. This time I'm going to start by actually defining it, and we're going to define it sloppily, and I'll improve it as we go. So n left, n left, uh, k right are variable, k left are variables. And I'm feeding it in exactly the way that I wanted to. So k right. There's a million ways you can do this yourself. I don't even know if I like this this notation. So leg list. Now I'm going to use one of my favorite functions in Mathematica here, which is block. Now block allows you to define temporary variables that get defined. You know that it, this first argument is a list of local variables that you can define. And there are some very useful local variables for building this kind of, this kind of product here. So those of you who can't see this <laughs> board, this is what we want to encode. We want to do this left amplitude times this R invariant times that. That's all we want to do. We just want to encode that line without typos, hopefully. So some of the arguments that are going to be useful are like n, which is the length of the leg list. And there's going to be some hatted argument, which is n hat. So we might as well declare it up here. If you don't set it in the top, it's just an undeclared free local variable. Um, there's a, which is n left, and a hat, which we're going to define in a bit. And then there's like a left legs, and there's a right legs. And the kind of terms that we're going to get here are amp k left, um, left legs, and then it should be the product, but I'm going to write a list just so I can debug. Um, so there's some kind of R invariant thing we're going to define in a moment. And then there's an amplitude on the right, k right, with right legs. Uh. Good. So let's just see what this thing looks like. Um, we'll say, instead of doing a sum, which is what the recursion relation does, we'll do a table. We'll just want to see what this thing looks like. So BCFW bridge, and we'll say term indices. Um, I think, uh, and then, ah, uh, see, I'm, I can't, I don't know if I can, yeah, I might as well, with, I'm gonna, I can't set anything constant, I have a moral of, uh, um, aversion to it. Okay, so term indices, and we'll do range n, um, and then term indices um, run over BCFW partitions, n and k. All right, that's a little silly, but okay, this is what it looks like. All right, that kind of looks right, but we don't, haven't defined anything yet. So our left legs are pretty simple. The first approximation, they're just the legs from one up to n left. So leg list, one up to n left. You can see that, okay, that looks like it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. And then the right legs are leg list from the n left minus one-th entry, the, that, that one, up to the minus one-th entry, the last entry. Okay. Perfect. Now what about these R's? The R eats 
the legs uh, 1, a minus 1, a, n minus 1, n. And, but of course, the, it's not just a's and n minus 1's, it's whatever the last entry is, whatever the eighth entry is, etc. So let's say this thing is leg list 1, um, a minus 1, a, n minus 1, n. Good. Now we have the R, now we have basically every building block we need to do. But we have to deal with the stupid hatted variables, which are defined here at the bottom of the line. And I'm going to postpone telling you what these are for as long as we can, because it doesn't really matter. The symbolic recursion doesn't, you don't need to really know what they are. Um, but, uh, but I do need to define it. So, so here, um, recall that a hat, a hat is, by this we mean a, um, a minus, a, a minus one, intersection, whatever that means, um, n minus one, n one. Now, because we all know LaTeX extremely well, I'm going to define a symbol which acts like the LaTeX call for that symbol. So I'm going to call it cap, a minus one, oh, a, a minus one, and then n minus one, n one. These are undefined symbols. Mathematica doesn't care what it is, but this is, it has all the data we need. So the, so what we're going to do here is we're, we're going to take, we're going to define a hat to be this thing, this, well, it's not that thing, it's cap leg list a, a minus one, leg list um, n minus one, n one. And then n hat is basically I complete, it's identical to it, it just has the a's and n's swapped. Couldn't possibly be simpler. All right, so now we have, presumably we have defined our a hats and things. And you'll notice that the, again, the left amplitude only has a hatted thing in where a used to be. So in the last entry, I need to replace a with a hat. So to do that, we're going to do um, left legs is replace part left legs. And I'm going to take the minus one entry, which again is the last entry, and I'm going to write, replace it with a hat. So let's see if it's doing what we thought it would do. So here, the first term on the left, it's the six was replaced with six, five, intersect, seven, eight, one. That looks right. And then the right legs have two re replaced things. Um, replace part right legs. Um, and the first entry is now a hat. And the last entry um, is n hat. All right, so I think we did it, we put everything together. Of course, we don't want a list of these kinds of things. We want the product of them. So now we're going to get this. All right, I think we're actually ready. We are ready, so putting everything together. Um, so, well, at least at this stage. So um, recall that we want a function um, R amp n and k, which is a list, it's a list of terms here. So let's just try something out. Let's say n equals 8, k equals 1 this time. Just because I'm going to say, yes? Quick question. Can, I, can we see what you did, um, how you did the replace part on the left legs and the right legs? So you replaced, what is that, negative 1, 2, eight. So that takes the last entry of the list, yeah. and it replaces, so it's the minus 1th entry of left legs. Oh. And it, and it sets it to a hat. And then so that's the first and the last, okay. The first one is a hat and the last one is n hat from the, this formula here. So you see the first one's a hat, the last one's n hat. Okay, yeah. Okay, this time I'm gonna do k equals one just cause, why not? Um, mix things up a bit, range n. So the idea here, if we bid everything correctly, we're just going to recurse. We're gonna do BCFW recurse. And it's going to break it up into a giant mess. And then we're going to do it again. And we're going to do it again. And we're going to do it again. And we're going to do it again until we get a bunch of R's. Good. And now, Mathematica has a built-in function for doing this recur repl re re uh, replace, 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 replace. And it's called replace repeated. And it's a double slash dot. So that's what we want. But of course, remember, I wanted a list. Um, of terms, aka monomials. So I want to wrap this thing in some in monomial list. And now it's a list of terms. 
And if I look at the eight point, and well, if I look at the eight point, and, well, let's do a seven point n squared image view that's more readable. Now it's a list of terms which are each a product of two R invariants. One's got all sorts of weird arguments, the other one's usually pretty normal. All right, good. So we're, we're actually completely done. Our amp, our goal, first goal, is just this function. Good. We could store it to memory, but I don't have time. Um, okay, so this is actually a crucial part, mixing it up. So the fact that this formula it picked out one, legs 1 and n, which somehow we chose globally every single time we did it to take the first entry to the last entry, this is absurd. BCFW doesn't tell you which legs to pick as the special ones. So we'd like to randomize this, if for no other reason than it's going to give us internal consistency check to everything. Um, so let's um, randomly um, choose which pair of legs um, to uh, use for 1 and n in the recursion by randomly rotating every amp, amp every symbol amp um, before it gets recursed. So he, what I mean here is that like with, let's say that we had our leg list is uh, 1 through 7. What I'd like to do is like rotate left, um, rotate left, um, leg list. If I do that, it'll just rotate it left. If I, there's a second, optional second argument. If I did it, rotate it left zero amount, it does nothing. If I rotate it left negative amounts, it rotates it to the right, etc. But we'd like to rotate it randomly. So we're going to rotate it by a random integer um, from zero to the length of the leg list. Now it's going to randomly give us a shifted set of legs. Let's def so let's define um, um, random um, rotate amp, which amp, amp k leg list. It takes this and it just does amp k, and it does this rotated junk, this randomly rotated junk. Okay, so with this we can define our BCF recurse random, which is very much like BCFW recurse. Um, except that we're going to first apply this silly thing. Um, trust me, this is going to pay off. Um, so first it's amp k leg list. The first thing I do is I random rotate the amplitude. And then I just use exactly the same code we already had, BCFW recurse. So it's the simplest thing in the world. We just are, Every time we see an amplitude, we're going to first rotate it completely randomly, and then we're going to apply recursion. That has the effect of basically picking random legs. Um, for bonus points, you can implement parity, but that's actually a different formula, so it's a bit more involved. Okay, so we actually now have a better function, or at least a more interesting one, called which we're going to define as R amp random, and we're just going to do the exact same thing, but with the random version of BCFW recursion. So let's just compare what they look like. R amp is always the same thing, so it's, it's kind of boring, but let's look at R amp random, say 8 point NM NMHV. It's that list of 10 terms, or that list, or that list, or that list. I think it would be pretty impressive if they were all the same. Okay? And it gets more impressive if you start looking at these 8 particle n squared MHV. You start becoming non-trivial identities. Good. So, um, with that we are actually done. We've achieved our first goal. And now we ne need to move on to teaching Mathematica supersymmetry and then checking our results. Alright, these are both relatively easy. Um, and the first lesson is that um, let's say the right way. Um, well, I'll just say um, it's not cleverly, it's just not stupidly. So, I mean, so many people, and I mean, I, I was guilty of this too. Um, you're a young student, you learn about Grassmann, Grassmann variables, and you try to teach Mathematica what a determinant is. Um, or you try to teach Mathematica what anti, like a redefined products, it's just a mess. You don't want to do anything like that. Because, in fact, actually all the super functions we care about are in a really nice form. And so let me just show you what, I mean, what these things are. They're these kinds of things. They're products, it's a bunch of eta coefficients times some bosonic bit. And a, a, firm, a fermionic function times, uh, sorry, bosonic function times a fermionic delta function. We can just encode this as the matrix of coefficients and the fermionic function. So, um, we want to, so goal, um, take the products of R invariants and return standardized superfunctions. 
Um, so please read the notes, because I think this is actually an important point. So the idea here is that we have some, some sort of function f, some normal bosonic function um, f uh, times some delta of c dot some matrix of etas. And I want to, um, good, that thing worked. I want to trade this for f, um, oops, fc. So the pair fc. And I'm going to call this thing um, glibly the um, bosonic bit and the eta coefficients. OK. So from this, the reason why this is a good idea is because this whole fermionic integration junk and all these anti-commutation junk is really kind of trivial. What it means is that every bosonic function is just the f times, in our case, four k by k minors of eta coefficients. So you just take four determinants, any four you'd like, and I will leave it as an exercise for you to work out which field component corresponds to which choice of four k by k minors. But I will save you a bit of work and just tell you that if you take the exact same minor four times, you get a gluonic component. Um, so that's, uh, well, at least you would if we were in momentum space. Anyway, in momentum twister space, it's a little bit more involved. OK, so let's, do the let's first start with the bosonic bit which is completely trivial. So the idea is that we, we have this list of products of R invariants. We'd like to convert them all into the standard form. But we know that they start off life like this. So all we need to do is somehow take this R invariant and, re and return the denominator is what we want at, for the bosonic bit. So let's say we have R, A, B, C, D, E. And R, we're going to define a rule, R, X. And the first thing we need to do is get rid of the stupid R on the top. So let's just call it list X. So this is, we need something that's going to act on this list. Now this is, I actually thought about this a lot, and I cannot think of any good way for you to stumble on this or for me to cheat and pretend like it was obvious. It's like the only non-advanced, um, non yet simultaneously not obvious function in Mathematica, but it is one that you should all know, um, called partition. Um, and just like every Mathematica built-in function, there's a million sub-options, but there's one that plays a huge, that is extremely recurringly useful, and that is, K11. So 211 gives you the list of all the pairs, including the wrapping one. Okay, so this gives you like the Park Taylor denominator. Um, and if I did 311, it would give me the list of all triples. Okay, and if I did 411, it starts giving me the arguments that I want here, because I need the five consecutive four brackets of this thing. So I want to do partition on this 411. That's going to give me the list of things that I need, and then I'm going to Define, this is actually the first appearance of angle bracket. I'm not going to, I'm only going to teach Mathematica what angle bracket is very cautiously at the very end and only temporarily because I, you don't want to tell math, you don't, you want to leave Mathematica on a need to know basis. So, but it's an angle bracket and I don't want to draw those stupid symbols and so I'm just going to call it AB, angle bracket. And of course what we really want is times that we want the product of them and we want the inverse of it. So this is it. In fact, we're, we're done. This is trivial. Um, bosonic rule is just this rule. So that's all we actually need to apply. We're, we've got we'll do the bosonic part of any of the terms in BCFW. We're done. Okay, so it's slightly less hard, which is the um, eta coefficients. Less trivial. It's mostly less trivial just because of the, or there's an organizational problem involved. So let's just look for at an example, let's say um, R amp, and I'm just not going to use the random one, but let's say 8 particle n squared MHV, and it's 20 terms. Let's just look at the last one at something like this. So notice that there's one R invariant that's just like a bunch of normal good things, and there's this uglier one here. Let's actually just work with the uglier one because it's instructive. So I'm going to look at this. By the way, every single R invariant gives you one row of this matrix. So you just want to get a row for each R invariant. That's all you need. This, that's the function we want to get. So from this, we would like, we basically need to extract the same kind of data, um, which is we'd like it to um, give partition x411. Um, in fact, we'd like it to be angle bracket on that business. So, well, that's not very instructive. But these are the coefficients of the etas. Maybe let's look at the first one just because it's a little simpler. So this 1, 4, 5, 7, 8, this is what, these are the coefficients of the etas. And of course, this is the coefficient of eta 8, and this is the coefficient of eta 1. Yeah, it's a bit annoying that they're not lined up correctly. So let's rotate this to the left, just by 1. 
And now you can see that this is the coefficient of the first one, this is the coefficient of the second one, et cetera. I mean, said another way, the argument of that delta function that people like to write is eta x is this dot product. Okay? That is the argument, and that it follows directly from this definition here. Okay? Anyway, so this is the coefficient. Now I can do this with the, the uglier one with all the intersections, but it's going to be a little hard to read. Um, <clears throat> but let's, let's do it, actually, because we need to. So last, so notice that some of the etas are normal things, right? But, but we want to get the matrix of coefficients of the external etas, and what the heck is this eta cap business? So recall that, um, that this AB inter um, CDE is defined to be the twister ZA, by, d by recall, I mean, look at this, this memo. There's a definition there. Um, okay. ZA times angle bracket um, BCDE. Um, plus ZB, angle bracket, um, CDEA. So that's, what, it, that's what, what we mean. So we, all we want to do is just repeatedly replace this. So we want to say eta, if we see an eta, oh, I actually used the nice eta. So if we see an eta, cap, for some A and some B, and I would write CDE, but it's a little annoying, and Mathematica has a nice way of doing pattern recognitions. CDE always goes together, so I'm just going to do a double underscore for an, a pattern of arbitrary length for C. Um, this, every time you see this, we're going to replace it with A to A times angle bracket BC. Again, C is the collectively C, D, and E, so whatever it is, plus um, A to B um, times angle bracket CA. So we're going to apply this. In fact, I'll, I'll cut it just because I don't want it to screw, screw up the, the screen. And we're going to apply it together with that rule. But now notice it didn't actually do anything. I don't know if you could see that, but it didn't do anything. And the reason is because this re replacement acts on the first argument it can. And so in order for you to even have any action on the second rule, you need to replace repeatedly. Now you'll notice that there are no more caps in any of the etas, and you can expand this thing out, and it makes sense. So, but now we want... Remember that I, I am, I'm, I'm asking for, we want um, the matrix um, of coefficients of the etas. Okay, now there's actually a million ways of doing it and most of the ways I can think of are less transparent. The, le the most transparent way I think is just, you don't know what function to call, so you try to ask Mathematica, what is coefficient Coefficient list, coefficient, coefficient rule, coefficient array. That seems like a matrix. Okay, so it eats a polynomial and it gives you, and with given variables, it tells you what the coefficients of those variables are. Well, it sounds exactly like what we want. So coefficient arrays on that expression, eta range eight. So for all the eight twisters, ugh, look what it did. It gave us a zero. What the heck is that doing? And this ugly sparse array. If you're unfamiliar with this, this is a very memory safe, safe way of storing a matrix, but for our purposes I'm going to get rid of it. So let's get rid of this, first let's just get rid of that zero coefficient, and then we'll do normal, which converts it into a normal matrix expression. Okay, now the claim is that if I take this, this object, and I dot it into eta range 8, that this minus the previous expression, um, and it's actually not obviously zero, um, let's see, expand, so what does it look like? So I'm going to take the, so, see it took a little moment, but there it is, it's zero. So all I did was just replace this, but now I have the coefficient array. Perfect. Okay, so let's put everything together. Um, to super function is what we want. Now it needs an n because it needs to know how many etas there are. An expression, and I, I'm going to call it expression just because I'm tempted to, um, but you should know for future reference that expression must be a product of R's. So it's important to act on the right level of an expression. It's not going to take a list of products of R's, it's going to do one of them. Okay, so two super function. What is it going to look like? It's going to return bosonic bit and then an eta coefficients. That's what it's going to return. Now what are these, um, what are the local variables? So a bosonic bit is obvious. Bosonic bit is definitely one of our functions. And it's simple. It's just the expression with this bosonic rule. 
That's all we do. Trick couldn't be simpler. The expression, the, the eta coefficients are a little bit more involved. Let's go ahead and define it as a symbol. Because it needs to act on each row, each R gives you a row of this matrix. So let's, get, let's take an R list, which is the cases of, from the expression of the symbol R something. And unfortunately, for reason, I need to specify from zero. It's really zero to one. Because if I gave you, a, if it was just a single term with a single R, I would need to specify that it's the zeroth entry. Anyway, this is going to return all the R's that it sees in the expression. So, bosonic bit, we're already done. Eta coefficients. It's basically, uh, could, that's almost as simple as it could possibly be. It's just the R list. And then we're going to apply this replacement rule we just developed up here, this business, that replaces R with this dot product and then expands all the etas, does that junk, okay? Um, oh, and of course, we need to get the coefficient arrays. That's important. So we're going to get this. And unfor uh, but instead of acting on the line above, which is a nice thing to act on, we're going to act on, on hashtag. And we're going to map it over everything there. And instead of 8, it better be n. So our eta coefficients is that. Good. So if I did this correctly, let's just assume I did. <laughs> so let's call it super amp. Instead of r amp, we're going to have it, uh, super amp nk which is to super function n um, r amp n and k. So now it's going to, instead of a list of products of r invariants, it gives you a list of super functions in the standard form, bosonic part, matrix. Super amp random, random, r amp random. Um, okay, so let's see like, like what do these things look like. R, um, super amp uh, 6, 2, the six point MHV bar amplitude, and it's only one term, so let me just grab um, the first, okay, so it's some bosonic bit and then some matrix. What does that, let's look at the matrix. So we say last of that, which is, and we're going to look at matrix form. So it's a matrix of coefficients, and that looks, looks right. I dot that into a bunch of etas, and I, or I take determinants of that thing, and I get the function. All right, good. I think we're almost done. Now we just need to define um, extracting... And it kind of breaks my heart that I don't have time to code, code up extracting all components for you, but I'm going to cheat and I'm going to actually define it almost in enough generality that you can easily surgically replace this. But for the purposes of at least this tutorial, I'm just going to, we're just going to pick one choice of the four by four of the, of the K by K minors, um, and we're just going to take it four times and we're just going to declare that to be our reference function. So we want to define a reference um, component function uh, to test things on. Um, and I'm going to try to define this function in such a way that it's very easy for you to fix it. Um, because again, remember that what we want here, so um, a component amplitude would be the bosonic bit times four k by k minors of the eta coefficients. So the one that we're going to define is called the split. We're going to take the split one, which it corresponds to the split helicity gluonic amplitude. This is proportional to that up to a pretty trivial prefactor if you want to go up to momentum space, um, which is just the split helicity um, component function, which corresponds to taking the first k, um, uh, oops, by k minor four times. So it's the stupidest thing you can do. So let's say split component. That is going to, its, it's argument is um, bosonic bit and then eta coefficients. And I don't really need all this block business, but I want to make it that. So basically it's just, it's bosonic bit um, times a four eta determinants of the eta matrix. But I'm going to write it in a way that's a so product Debt eta coefficients minor. So a particular choice of k by k minors. And we're going to choose minor from minor list. And we haven't defined what that is yet. So first, a useful thing is what is how big is this silly matrix? K is the length of eta coefficients. And if let's say that was length three, so we have range three, we'd like to do, and we'd like to pick, we'd like minor list to be range k four times. And this is the way to do that, range four. Oops. 
so that's the way to do it. So I apologize for the bit minor list. We're going to take minor list to be range k, this weird business, range four times. Okay, so let's see if let's see if this does what we're what we expect it to. So split component, we have to apply this to every single term in the super in the super amp. Let's say six two. Oops, something's wrong. What is wrong? Um, what is wrong? Um, can anybody? Anybody help here? Let's see. I forgot a hash. No, but there's a problem with this determinant here. Um, it doesn't seem to like this matrix. Range k. Wait, so some, did somebody actually find the mistake? Um, product debt eta. Oh, ah, yes, yes, thank you. Okay. The a matrix, the eta coefficients is a k by n matrix, and I want to take the columns of the minors. So all minor. Good. Doesn't look sensible to anybody, but we can compare it to random. Lots of weird formulas for so hopefully the same exact function. And we can do this maybe for more a less scary looking function. So the eight particle NMHV amplitude. Lots of formulas. The formula, these terms look right, to me at least, so they have a possibility of, of not being silly. All right, so let's, um, let's actually check. And it's good that we baked this thing in because I don't know if we're gonna have a time. Well, maybe we, we might actually. When did I start? Um, we have uh, 10 minutes, there you go. Okay, 10 minutes is enough to do two things. So the first is kind of an algorithmic consistency check, and then I'm gonna, we're gonna do a physics consistency check. Both of these are very important. Um, so the algorithmic consistency check is that we're gonna verify that all these silly, weird looking formulas, and they get pretty complicated and pretty random when we go up, that they all give exactly the same numbers if we put in numbers. That's actually a huge, huge consistency check because of the uh, complexity of these formulas. Um, and anyway, a single evaluation is enough to uniquely identify a rational function, um, as long as it is a sufficiently large evaluation. Um, so that's pretty good consistency. But the physics consistency check is that if you didn't even know that, if you didn't do this randomization business, you would still like to check something about the answer that would t signal that it wasn't silly, that it wasn't wrong. And we're gonna check spurious pole cancellation there. So let's do this. So let's do evaluation and verification. And verification, this is huge. Like the whole rest of the notebook is a waste of time if we can't pass a verification test. So, okay. Um, the kinematic data is specified by a four by n matrix of momentum twisters, twisters, which we're gonna define in a moment here. But importantly, um, note um, a, an unconstrained um, set of momentum twisters um, always defines um, momentum conserving on shell massless um, for momenta. And in particular, this means that we might as well define a lot of them, um, define more than we need. Um, um, so we can just make a, this four by n matrix, we can make it four by 100, and it's just gonna pick some random twisters from this list. So how do we pick random numbers? Well, there's a nice function called random integer. I like integers more than real numbers for lots of reasons. So let's say we wanna pick a random integer between one and 50, that's what it looks like. Just like many functions in Mathematica, there's usually second, secondary arguments which you can specify. So I can take four and it'll give you four of them. But if I want a matrix of it, I can just take, let's say 20 by four. Now I got a bunch of integer momentum twisters. So let's call this momentum twister data. And it's a different random list. But okay, so here's our kinematics. Now let's teach Mathematica how to evaluate things. Um, teach very cautiously um, Mathematica 
what angle bracket means. We want to be very careful about this because this is because you don't want it to remember what this data is. You don't want to it don't we don't want it to pollute your recursion formulas and stuff like this. You want to be very careful about it. So we're going to do this in a slightly unusual looking way, which is I'm going to define a function called evaluate. And it's going to eat an expression and it's basically just going to tell Mathematica that angle bracket means determinant, but it's going to do it in a funny way. In particular, we're going to define one local variable called out, okay? And at some point we're going to call out equals expression. And then we're going to return out. Now what are we going to do in between? The first thing we're going to do is we're going to tell Mathematica what angle bracket is. We're going to say, but it only knows determinants if it's an integer. So only if x is all integers. Um, is it integer or integers? I can't remember. Integer. Good. Okay. Um, and we're going to actually store it kind of permanently in memory for a moment, which is determinant of momentum twister data x. Okay, actually I need an extra bracket there. Okay, but now, as soon as I've, so then this line calls, it just, it just looks at expression, knowing this thing that it, I just taught it. And as soon as that's over, I, wanna, I want it for, to forget. So we're going to clear all. Um, angle bracket. All right, so now it does not know what it is, and then it will return the thing that it learned in the intermediate expression. So let's just see what, we haven't defined what the intersections are, so let's just look at it though. So, um, uh, split component um, of, say, superamp um, 6.2. It looks something like that. And we do evaluate. And OK, some of the things turned into numbers. But we're still missing these caps. And there, we're just going to use the exact same rule we always did, although I'm going to format it slightly differently, which is uh, useful if this is like medium level Mathematica syntax, which is x, so an arbitrary depth which includes a, a list of length empty, cap, a, b, and then c, y, again, arbitrary lips, list of possible length entry, or empty, and we're going to replace this cap business with either a or b, so it's x, a, y, times angle bracket b, c, plus angle bracket x, b, y, angle bracket c, a. Okay. Yes? So why don't we just define AB as local and log instead of just clearing all of the uh, You could, but I actually, you're actually, it's a good idea, but I would even suggest something safer, which is to put it in a module and, and put a, um, uh, an unevaluated call on it so that it doesn't, so that in case somebody else defined what angle bracket meant, it wouldn't, it would forget it before it ran into evaluation. So there's actually better ways of protecting this, which is to, um, uh, uh, Delay evalu evaluation delayed, um, and then actually define it as its own private symbol. Which, by the way, this is like good programming etiquette that I'm being sloppy about here. But like the the fact that I use this ADA symbol, um, that's possibly potentially dangerous territory. You should probably protect it with a module or something like that. Which so module is like block except for that it doesn't take definitions that exist in the universe. It starts everything fresh, and it defines a completely unique symbol internally for it. So it'll never have any conflict in namespace. Another question, why don't you use modules? Um, I like the coloring of block better. <laughs> That's honestly like the, about, about as good as the, I mean, module is a safer language most of the most of. That's, that's a good point. I mean, occasionally I actually want, the, so everybody should read. I'm a big fan of the documentation center and there's actually like a long discussion on blocks versus modules, and it's a good read, like when you're in bed and you're tired. <laughs> um, read the debate, it's a good debate, and there's points on both sides, and anyway. And m for this notebook, I have not ha made a legitimate reason for pr choosing block once. It was always just coloring. Okay, so this is, this is what the super component looks like. Now let's see our magical test, although for the six point amplitude, it's not going to be very um, in interesting. Random. Well, let's just let's just make sure that I'm not cheating you. Evaluate. So some giant mess. That number. That number. Ah, I think we're close. Let's do something worse. With n equals eight, k equals two. That amplitude that I love so much. Let's try um, evaluate split component. Um, uh, uh, superamp random uh, n k. 
Okay, so let's just see what this thing looks like. Some horrible expression. Let's just do eight one just so I can look it on the one screen. So some pretty ugly expressions. And let's total this. Oh, that's a pretty ugly irrational number. I think we have pretty good confidence that this is the right answer. Okay? And we could do this at 8 point n squared MHV, although you're going to have to believe me that the func numbers are different. We can do, look at how fast it's going, by the way, too. And this is, is 100,000 times slower than it needs to be. Um, K equals 5. Mm, 100,000 times is, is bad. But n to the fifth MHV is kind of a waste of time. It's the parity conjugate of, uh, of n squared MHV. Um, but let's see, how bad is it? Well, maybe. Although I kind of like rational numbers. The reason is because the kind of precision you would need to match to, to verify this um, kind of a rational number is, is pretty enormous in, in floating point. But if you see a 100-digit number divided by a 100-digit number is equal to a 100-digit number divided by 100, that's like a fingerprint of the function. And this can actually be made extremely precise. There's a very precise sense in which you can uniquely characterize any rational function by a single data point like this. Um, it's a kind of a fun exercise. How many evaluations do you need to specify a polynomial if you know that the coefficients are bounded? You don't, it doesn't depend on the degree or anything. The answer is always 1. Anyway, I'll leave that as a homework assignment. Okay, let's, in the last five minutes, because I don't have much time here, let's do the physics check, which is, the, which is the check that we really should be doing anyway, because the fact that all these random looking functions are equal to each other isn't the real acid test that we didn't screw things up. Let's check um, cancellation of spurious poles. Because that's also a built-in check of BCFW, which is that every single term has all sorts of spurious crap. And the fact that the, the sum is free of spurious poles is a huge consistency check on everything. So um, recall that the only physical poles of a planar ampl ordered amplitude are Mandelstam's of the form um, S from a consecutive range, S up to B minus 1, which is proportional to angle bracket A minus 1 A um, B minus 1 B, angle bracket. So let's just look at, so that means that if we have these, these integer valued momentum twisters, if I multiply by all of these angle, all these physical poles, I should get an integer, right? Right, so let's, let's try doing this. So let's say with n equals 8, I just want to extract all the physical poles. So what does that look like? I'm going to use my, that function that I told you about a moment, a little while ago, partition range n two one one. That gives me all the pairs this a minus 1 a business. I'm going to take, I'm going to take pairs um, of these things, 2. I'm going to join them together. Oops. I'm going to join them together. So I got a list of these things. And I'm going to get rid of all the ones that would vanish, which is going to be delete cases. Um, and here's a nice pattern recognition for you. So how do you find an element of a list with a repeated entry? It looks like a, it's a pattern of the following form. x and then a y somewhere, and then a z of arbitrary length, and then another y, and then a w of arbitrary length. We're going to delete all those. Now we have all the terms that are non-vanishing, so we're going to say times, angle bracket, there. So we're going to define our function physical poles for any n, and it's this business. So let's check spurious pole cancellation. With n equals 8, k equals, I don't know, let's start with 1. Actually, it doesn't matter. Let's do k equals 2. I like k equals 2. Um, so here we're going to do evaluate um, physical poles, n. And we're going to multiply this by split component um, uh, super amp random, n. Uh, oops, n and k. Um, oh, I need to evaluate that. Well, that looks like a bunch of junk. Um, I don't actually care what these numbers are. Let's just check whether or not they're integers. Integer q is the test. And this map is going to do it. No, lots of them are not integers. Some of those integers that say true, by the way, are zeros. So not especially interesting integers. But anyway, a lot of falses there. And here's the acid test. Integer q total true. True, true, true. The sum is free of spurious poles. Lots of the individual terms have spurious poles. And go to the 10 point and cubed MHV amplitude. 175 terms, true. Okay. 
Now that evaluation there is pretty darn fast. It's much faster than what you'll get out there, but it's nowhere near as good as it could be. So let me actually end with some homework for you. I'm going to uh, make this notebook available at the one exactly that I've just done in front of you. It's going to be online. Um, so you can peruse it in your free time and improve it if you'd like. So the first bit of homework is to um, improve efficiency C of everything above. And I can, I can tell you, I mean, a few things that are kind of low-lying fruit. Like, for example, the fact that we're doing this replacement rule is just silly. It's because I didn't want to take the time to store it permanently. Um, really what you should do is define a symbol amplitude where you then replace the labels. So you actually want to permanently define a reference amplitude and then just call a label replacement. That's the best way to do this. Um, so you, that, that'll buy you a factor of 100 to 1,000. Another thing is, actually, you should, may, some of you might have intuited this, but the, the fact that the uh, extraction of the eta coefficients involved dotting a row into a matrix and then picking up the coefficients is very silly. Um, and this can be done much more efficiently directly and thinking about this as a, as a row operation. Um, you know, I basically extracted the rules, dotted it into something, and then used coefficient arrays. It's a giant recursive mess. That'll buy you a factor of five or six. Um, evaluations can be improved a lot. Um, anyway, so, so there's a lot of low-lying fruit. Um, within, a f within a half hour, you should be able to improve this by about, ten th uh, by, by about a thousand. Okay. Um, and the, considering that this is better than what's available on the market, and as the author of what's now unfortunately called efficient tree amplitudes um, in n equals 4, um, because it's you know, a little bit embarrassing from today's perspective, anyway, this is, uh, this is good to have in your back pocket. Um, so the next thing that you should do is to generalize um, the component extraction. And you should really do this homework assignment because I really think this is the right way to think about all these super functions. So this extraction of t choosing k or four k by k minors of the matrix, there are so there's binomial n choose k or I mean n choose k to the fourth different components, and you should understand this well enough. You should I uh, is real real homework. You really should do it. You should understand which component amplitude, which field content corresponds to which choice. And I'll give you a hint. It's pretty easy. So if you have like the entry, col if column one appears three times among these, this list, then you're picking up three R charges for, particle, for that particle. Okay. Um, but interestingly enough, all of this generalized component extraction is kind of a silly, unusual thing because nobody cares about component amplitudes and momentum twisters at all. The split one that I defined is just proportional to the split helicity gluonic amplitude, but that's kind of an exceptional case. And so the last thing I'm going to leave you to do is um, um, uplift this um, to momentum space, where components, where a fermion means what you think it means, instead of a momentum twister fermion, which is usually some linear combination of crap. Um, so uplift this to momentum space, and that's easiest to do in this matrix notation as well. So with that, I will end, and thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. yes. Yeah. But do we have a code to for calculate the decomposition of the amplitude to the sum of the contribution? Ah, yes. 